The seven bowls of revelation. The scariest prediction in the Bible. In a world close to falling apart, where people were searching for answers, a man named John stood in Patmos, the one to whom the secrets of the universe was revealed. This big secret has amazed and attracted people for many years. The concept of the bowls, often referred to as the bowls of wrath or vials of wrath, is found in the book of Revelation, which is the last book of the Bible. These bowls represent the final judgments from God that are poured out on the earth just before the end of the world. The seven bowl judgments are the last big events in a difficult time described in the Bible. They are extremely intense and worse than anything before. They are talked about in Revelation 16 verses 1 to 21. These bowls are like containers of God's wrath. By this time, people had done a lot of evil, especially under a leader called the Antichrist. So these seven bowls are God's response to all the calamity. They start when the seventh trumpet is played. The context of the bowls. A mere mention of the book of Revelation can send shivers down the spine, not because it contains the story of horror, but because it paints the cosmic struggle between good and evil, the final part of the human journey. As John's vision unraveled, he bore witness to a series of events that began with seals, followed by trumpets and climaxed with bowls. Each of these series unfolded with increasing intensity and urgency, signaling the finality of God's judgment upon a rebellious world. The book of Revelation offers a prophetic vision of the end times. These seven bowls are one of the three sets of seven judgments, alongside seven seals and seven trumpets that God unleashes upon earth. Revelation speaks about various terms such as seals, trumpets, bowls, lampstands, the dragon, and stars. The seals, trumpets, and bowls are disasters. The bowl of judgment happens at the end of the tribulation, and they are so devastating that, if they were to continue, every human life on earth would be wiped out. The Seven Seals The first series of judgments. When the Lamb, interpreted as Jesus, opens the seventh seal, there's silence in heaven for about half an hour, followed by the introduction of the seven trumpets the seven trumpets. This is the second series of judgments. When the seventh trumpet sounds, the third set of judgments, the seven bowls, begins. The seven bowls. This is the final and most severe judgment. An angel pours out each bowl, and each bowl brings a plague or catastrophe upon the earth or its inhabitants. Before the bowls. Before the seven bowls are poured out, there are a series of other events and judgments. The seals. These began with the four horsemen. The end times, as foretold in the book of Revelation, were upon humanity. The world, already in chaos, was now about to witness the outpouring of God's wrath. The seven bowls of judgment. The severe calamities begin. The first bowl. Revelation 16 begins with a loud voice from the temple, saying to the seven angels, Revelation 16 verses 1 to 2, Amplified Bible. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple, saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath and indignation of God. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and loathsome and malignant sores came on the people who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped his image. The first angel carrying his bowl approached the earth and emptied its contents. Immediately a terrifying change occurred. Those who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped its image, the very emblem of their rebellion against the Creator, were suddenly afflicted. 
a foul and loathsome sore appeared on their bodies. People who once proudly showed their mark are now hurting and have painful sores on their skin. The mark of the beast appears in Revelation. The mark of the beast is referred to as the mark of the beast because it is brought into being by a man who is referred to as the beast. Six seals and six trumpets are over. The very last series of disasters is starting. The Seven Bowls. It will be the worst for the world. Evil powers will gain a tighter grip on society than ever before, though their hold is about to be broken. In this section, three individuals come together to form an alliance with the goal of ruling the world. Among them is the Devil. The other two are human in origin and nature, known as the Antichrist and the False Prophet. According to the Bible passages in Revelation 16:2 and 19:20, the mark of the beast is a symbol that distinguishes those who worship the beast. Revelation shows us the economic strategy of the first beast and the second beast. He causes all to receive a mark. A mark will be given to everyone under the government of the beast and his associate. This mark is necessary to participate in the economy, and those without it will not be able to buy or sell anything. Only those bearing a special number on a visible part of their body, the hand or forehead, will be allowed to trade, and the number will only be marked on those who engage in imperial idolatry. The number 666 is the coded name of the dictator. The technology to give people a mark that enables them to buy and sell in the electric economy is available. In the Bible, the word mark is only connected to the beast. The Greek term karagma usually refers to imprints on coins or documents. Karagma was the official imperial seal of the Roman Empire and was used on official documents during the first and second centuries. These marks are now sores. The Apostle Paul had once written to the Romans, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 6.23 Now those wages were becoming painfully evident. The rest of humanity witnessing this had a choice to make. Would they recognize this as a sign of God's judgment and turn back to Him? Or would they harden their hearts and continue down a path of rebellion? As the subsequent bowls would be poured, the division between light and darkness, righteousness and wickedness would become even more pronounced. In these times, the words of the psalmist resonated more than ever. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Hebrews 10.31, referencing the Old Testament. Yet, even in His wrath, God's mercy remained evident. This judgment, like the plagues of Egypt, served as a warning. The Second Bow Following the first bowl, which brought painful sores upon those who bore the mark of the beast, the heavens prepared for another momentous act. The angel stepped forward. In his hands he held a bowl filled with a mysterious liquid. Revelation 16.3 recounts the moment. Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood as if of a dead man and every living creature in the sea died. As the contents of the bowl touched the waters of Earth, a chilling transformation began. The clear blue ocean, full of life, began to change into a deep, thick red color. It looked like the dark, thick blood you'd see from a dead body. This change was not merely symbolic or superficial. The transformation ran deep altering the very essence of the waters. Revelation 8 verses 8 to 9 described a partial contamination of the sea. The contamination is complete here. Every living creature in the sea died. We read, blood as of a dead man. 
The sea doesn't necessarily become blood, but as of a corpse's blood. It will match the appearance and sickening character of the blood in a dead body. You couldn't hear whales or dolphins anymore. Everything was still. Fishermen who used to happily fish will now be shocked by the destruction. Towns that relied on fish for food were in trouble. This reminds us of a story from the Bible where God turned the Nile River in Egypt into blood. This happened because the Pharaoh wouldn't free the Israelites. However, the Bible's underlying message was never forgotten. Even in these dire moments, it speaks of hope, redemption, and God's unfailing love. The Third Bowl The rivers and springs aren't spared here either. They too turn into blood. Water, the very essence of life, is transformed into a symbol of death. Revelation 16, 4, Amplified Bible. Then the third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water, and they turned into blood. This complete contamination is in contrast to the partial, one-third pollution of fresh water shown in Revelation 8. When these judgments come, the time must be very short until the return of Jesus. With ecological disaster such as this, the human race cannot survive long. Imagine the terror of people when they approached their sources of fresh water, only to find them undrinkable, filled with the essence of life, yet offering death. Rivers that once sparkled under the sun, teeming with fish, now flowed thick and dark. Water sources that both people and animals used to drink from have now turned red, reminding everyone that the world is in chaos. The things that happened before were just a lead up to this big event that John predicted. The significance of this transformation is profound. Water, the source of life on earth had become blood, the symbol of life shed. It was as if the earth itself was lamenting, bearing witness to the consequences of humanity's rebellion against its creator. When the pain and torment of the people grew, a voice from the sky explained why this was happening in Revelation 16 verses 5 to 6. And I heard the angel of the waters saying, Righteous and just are you, who are and who were, O Holy One, because you judged these things, for they have poured out the blood of the saints, God's people, and the prophets, and you, in turn, have given them blood to drink. They deserve your judgment. This is the sobering reminder that the rivers and springs, which once offered refreshing sustenance, were now testaments to the cost of defiance and sin. The world was being called to repentance, one bowl at a time. In the face of such terrible judgments, John's vision serves as a stark warning, urging us to heed the words of the Almighty, to turn from wickedness and to seek the refuge found only in the grace of God. The Fourth Bowl It was time for the Fourth Bowl. An angel stepped forward, holding the next vessel of judgment. The target of this bowl was neither the land nor the water, but the very sun that lights up the sky. Revelation 16, 8, Amplified Bible. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and it was given power to scorch humanity with raging fire. All of a sudden, things started to change. The sun, which had always been a source of light, warmth and sustenance, was given a new and terrible power. It began to scorch the earth with an intensity never seen before. The heat was unbearable. Everywhere, people felt as if they were caught in an oven, their skin sizzling under the relentless fire from above. The pain was intense, searing through every bone, every fiber of their beings. And as they were scorched by the great heat, their hearts, rather than turning to God for mercy, became hardened. They shook their fists at the sky, 
not asking for help, but showing anger and disrespect to God. The failure of men to respond with repentance shows that knowledge or experience of judgment will not change man's sinful condition. Those who are not won by grace will never be won. Revelation 16.9 captures the gravity of their hearts. People were severely burned by the great heat, and they reviled the name of God who has power over these plagues, but they did not repent of their sin and glorify Him. This scene stands as a testament to the hardness of human hearts, even in the face of undeniable divine intervention. Throughout the Bible, it's evident that God desires repentance. As 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. The Fifth Bowl Upon the command of the heavens, the fifth angel set forth, directing his bow not to the seas, mountains, or rivers, but straight onto the very throne of the beast, the epicenter of wickedness. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom was plunged into darkness, and people gnawed their tongues because of the pain of their excruciating anguish and severe torment. Revelation 16.10 when this bowl was poured out, it made the sun disappear, turning the beast's kingdom completely dark. Think of a world with no light at all, but it's so dark you can't see anything. This darkness wasn't calm or soothing. It felt heavy and made people very uncomfortable. The profound darkness, however, was just the beginning of their torment. The darkness of the fifth bowl is a preview of hell itself. Those under the judgment of this fifth bowl stand, as it were, on the shores of the lake of fire. You'd think in the midst of such suffering that people might fall on their knees, calling out for mercy or forgiveness, even when they were hurting. Instead of asking for forgiveness, they chose to resist God's warnings. Instead of calling out for help or praying, they spoke with disrespect. Revelation 16:11 says, As they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their anguish and their sores, abscesses, boils, and they did not repent of what they had done nor hate their wickedness. Though surrounded by the unmistakable evidence of the Almighty's power and majesty, their hearts remained hardened resolute in their rebellion. The text concludes with a somber reflection of the state of humanity at this moment. And did not repent of their deeds. Revelation 16, 11. The Sixth Bow. The Sixth Angel, a divine being of power and purpose, held in his hand a bow filled with God's judgment. It was a vessel of divine purpose, and the angel knew the weight of its contents. The entire cosmos seemed to pause in reverence for what was to come. The angel poured out his bowl over the stretches of the great river Euphrates, an event of such magnitude could only be best described by John, who bore witness. Then, the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river, the Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way would be prepared for the coming of the kings from the east. Revelation 16, 12. As the water from the big Euphrates River went down, what used to block the way now became a clear path. The Euphrates River, an extended part of the Fertile Crescent area, is a significant landmark in scripture and a valuable resource in the Middle East as it runs through Turkey, Syria, and Iraq. The Bible refers to this river more than 50 times. The book of Genesis is where we are introduced to this particular river for the very first time in the Bible. 
In Genesis 2, it is stated that the Euphrates River was one of the four rivers that flowed out of the Garden of Eden. The Bible says that one day, the Euphrates River will dry up to make way for a king. Who is the king of the East? This drying up is not merely a climactic phenomenon, but seems to be orchestrated divinely as part of the unfolding events leading up to Armageddon. The identity of the kings of the East in Revelation 16:12 has been the subject of much speculation and interpretation throughout Christian history. The book of Revelation makes frequent use of a symbolic language, and its prophecies can frequently be difficult to understand, which leaves room for a variety of different interpretations. The expression, the kings of the East, has been analyzed from a variety of angles. Under the Antichrist, the wickedness of man has reached its peak, and it is met with God's wrath against sin. The river Euphrates drying comes in the sixth bowl. The sixth bowl judgment. The penultimate judgment of the tribulation is the drying up of the Euphrates River. The Romans believed that the Euphrates River served as an impregnable defense against an onslaught from the empires located further to the east. In those days, it stretched for a total of 1,800 miles, or 2,900 kilometers in length, and ranged in width from 300 to 1,200 yards. Massive armies from the east, including those of China, India, and Japan, were able to move westward with relative ease once the Euphrates River had dried up and turned into a road. Some speculate on the reason these armies of the East come westward. Some people have the notion that it is in response to a global figure known as the Antichrist, who is based in Europe. In the end, they will engage in combat with God. Next, the kings of the earth gather to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. The drying of the Euphrates is connected to a great war. With all these interpretations, the Bible suggests that the drying up of the Euphrates River is caused by an angel pouring out a vial or bowl of God's wrath. It indicates that the drying up is not the result of natural reasons, such as climate or the intervention of humans, but rather is an event that was divinely designed. The purpose is clear, to prepare a way for the kings of the East thereby setting the stage for the prophesied battle. The great battle happened at a place called Armageddon, or Har-Megiddo. But what is the Battle of Armageddon? Today, the term Armageddon is sometimes used in a more general sense to allude to any kind of cataclysmic battle, especially if it's seen as likely to result in widespread destruction or the annihilation of human life. According to the book of Revelation, the biblical term Armageddon alludes to the decisive final conflict that will take place in the future between God and the forces of evil. The word ultimately comes from the Hebrew word Armageddon, which means Mount Megiddo, the predicted location of the battle. The word Armageddon makes its only appearance in the Bible in Revelation 16. But that wasn't the only thing that day. After the water disappeared, three bizarre spirits appeared from a dark place. They seemed to come from the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Then I saw three impure spirits that looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Revelation 16:13. The spirits take the form of frogs. While ancient people of God saw them as unclean, Egyptians revered a frog goddess. The stage was set, the pieces in play, and the universe held its breath. The battle lines of good and evil were drawn clearer than ever before. As John's vision continued, he realized with deep reverence the gravity of the events unfolding. He penned, 
Look, I come like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and remains clothed, so as not to go naked and be shamefully exposed. Revelation 16, 15. The exact location of Armageddon is unclear because there is no mountain called Megiddo. Nevertheless, given the word Ha can also mean hill, the most likely site is the hill area that surrounds the plain of Megiddo, some 60 miles north of Jerusalem. Megiddo has been the site of conflict between numerous armies throughout history, including those of the Egyptians, Assyrians, Greeks, Romans, and Crusaders, as well as the troops of Napoleon. Megiddo was the site of battles during World War I. Two of the greatest catastrophes in biblical history occurred at Armageddon. The first was the death of Saul and his sons, 1 Samuel 31.8, and the second was King Josiah's death, 2 Chronicles 35.22. Demonic influences will cause the kings of the earth to gather their armies for an all-out assault. The Antichrist is going to be in charge of leading this movement. The Battle of Armageddon is a multifaceted conflict that features a wide range of participants, such as supernatural beings and the forces of good and evil. The drying up of the Euphrates and the Battle of Armageddon are two interconnected events in the prophetic timeline. The first event, which involves the river Euphrates drying up, serves as a preparation for the second event, which involves the Battle of Armageddon, clearing a geographical path for the Battle of Armageddon. It is a sign that the ultimate confrontation between good and evil will then lead to a new era of divine governance and peace. After the drying of the Euphrates, what will happen to the Antichrist while he leads the Armageddon to battle? The people will become more dissatisfied with the leadership of this global dictator who has broken every promise he has made throughout the Battle of Armageddon. Significant parts of the world will begin to build their own military forces in an attempt to overthrow him. Major world segments will begin to assemble their military forces and rebel against him. The Antichrist will crush some of the initial attempts at rebellion against the Antichrist. But something happens that prevents him from achieving his aim of destroying Israel and Jerusalem. If the Euphrates River is no longer there, the rulers of the Eastern Lands will have an easier time attacking the Antichrist. The moment they arrive, the greatest conflict in the annals of human conflict will get underway. The Seventh Bow In the heavens, the scene was dramatic. The seventh angel with the final bowl of God's punishment got ready to pour it out. This wasn't just any bow. It was like the last chapter of all the judgments that came before. It really showed how severe and final God's decision was. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne of God saying, it is done. It is all over. It is all accomplished. It has come. Revelation 16, 17. Amplified Bible. This proclamation wasn't just an announcement, but an affirmation of the completion of God's ultimate judgment on earth. After that, the sky reacted strongly, and there were flashes of lightning and loud rumbling and pearls of thunder, and there was a massive earthquake. Nothing like it has ever occurred since mankind originated on the earth. So severe and far-reaching was that earthquake. Revelation 16, 18, Amplified Bible. This wasn't just a regular storm. The world had never seen something this powerful. The intense earthquake showed how serious God's last decision was. Nature was upset in the spiritual world because of what God did. As the dust settled, another profound revelation emerged. Babylon, that great city representing human pride, defiance, and decadence, was remembered before God. And in that remembrance, she was handed the cup of his fierce wrath. 
The city, once formidable and dominant, it now splintered and fractured into three distinct parts. And its destruction was not an isolated event. Around the globe, other cities, bastions of human civilization, crumbled and collapsed in quick succession. The grandeur of man's achievements was swiftly being reduced to ruins. Such was the devastation that the very geography of the world altered. Then every island fled away, and no mountains could be found. Revelation 1620, Amplified Bible. The world, as humanity had known it, was reshaping itself, leaving no vestige of its former appearance. This announcement, coming from the throne itself, tells us that there will be no more delay. In mercy, God has stretched out this scene as much as he possibly could. The seals were followed by trumpets. The trumpets were followed by bowls. But there will be no more judgments upon the earth after this. It is done. The fact that the bowl is poured into the air may show judgment against the prince of the power of the air, Ephesians 2 verse 2, and his allies. Ephesians 2 verse 2, Amplified Bible in which you once walked. You were following the ways of this world, influenced by this present age, in accordance with the prince of the power of the air, Satan, the spirit who is now at work in the disobedient, the unbelieving who fight against the purposes of God. In these final judgments, God shakes the earth with a tremendous earthquake. The same is promised in Hebrews 12:26. His voice shook the earth at Mount Sinai then, but now he has given a promise saying, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the starry heaven. The book of Revelation provides a more detailed account of the fall of Babylon, the great city. It suffices to say that God presents her with the cup of the wine of his fierce anger. But how did humanity react in the midst of the chaos? One would hope for repentance or an acknowledgement of the divine hand at work. Yet, even as massive hailstones, each weighing about a hundred pounds, plummeted from the sky, the human spirit remained stubborn. The people, rather than seeking forgiveness or understanding, cursed God. Revelation 16, 21 and giant hailstones as heavy as a talent fell from the sky on the people, and people reviled and spoke abusively of God for the plague of the hail, because the plague was so very great. Their hearts, hardened by years of rebellion, couldn't grasp the magnitude of their error. Thus, the seventh bowl wasn't merely a demonstration of God's power, but a clear indication of human frailty and the consequences of persistent defiance. The story serves as a somber reminder that while God is patient and merciful, there comes a time when justice must prevail. The story in Revelation is about how people react when they see God's great power. When clear signs from God appear, people still won't change their bad behavior. This shows how stubborn and rebellious humans can be. The main message here is that despite the severity of God's judgment, many people on earth refuse to repent or acknowledge God's sovereignty. Yet, the fourth bowl's grievous events remind us that the end times will be marked by judgment for those who reject Him. The choice for humanity, then and now, remains the same. Repent and give glory to God or face the consequences of a hardened heart. The book of Revelation talks about the world's ending and God's final plan. With each bowl poured out, the urgency and gravity of God's judgment become clearer. The events described aren't meant to simply incite fear, but to underscore the profound consequences of a world that turns its back on its creator. In the story, there are seven bowls showing God's anger. The seven bowls are especially important because they have deep meanings and predictions. 
a demonstration of God's wrath and judgment against evil. The seven bowls serve as a profound testament to God's righteous indignation against the wickedness and rebellion of humanity. As each bowl is poured out, the earth experiences unprecedented calamities, from painful sores afflicting people, Revelation 16.2, to the sun scorching the earth with intense heat, Revelation 16.8. These events are not arbitrary acts of cruelty, but rather a reflection of the biblical principle. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Galatians 6 verse 7. The bowls are a direct response to man's actions, emphasizing that persistent sin and rebellion have consequences. A call to repentance. Remarkably, even amidst the terrifying unfolding of these events, the heart of God remains consistent. He desires repentance and reconciliation. It's a heartbreaking revelation of the stubbornness of the human heart. Even when faced with the undeniable power and judgment of God, many choose defiance over repentance. God's intention is never to destroy for the sake of destruction. Rather, his judgments are, in part, meant to lead people to a realization of their need for him. As 2 Peter 3 verse 9 tells us, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. The bowls aren't merely isolated incidents of judgment. They set the stage for the grand finale of human history, leading to the Battle of Armageddon and God's ultimate victory over evil. Revelation 16, verse 16. In essence, the seven bowls of Revelation are not just judgments, but messages. They speak of the seriousness with which God views sin, His deep desire for humanity to repent and return to Him, and his promise to eradicate evil and establish his eternal kingdom. For believers, they offer hope, a reminder that no matter how dark the world may seem, God's light and truth will always shine victorious. As you reflect on the seven bowls, remember that Revelation isn't just about endings, it's about new beginnings. Beyond the bowls lies the hope of a renewed creation, where pain, suffering, and death are but distant memories. For those who heed the message and turn towards the light, a new dawn awaits. So why are all these important? Because the Bible tells us that these events are like puzzle pieces that fit into a bigger picture. These things will happen as part of God's big plan, and it reminds us that God is in control of everything even long rivers and the future. And that is the fascinating story of the Euphrates River from the days of the Garden of Eden to the mysterious future discussed in the book of Revelation. As with much biblical prophecy, the connection between these two events is a powerful reminder that God's plan is intricately designed purposeful and moving towards a culmination that will forever change the fabric of time, space, and spirituality. The Bible is a book of predictions. Its pages contain 735 prophecies about the future. A prediction can be found in one quarter of the Bible's chapters. From beginning to end, it is basically a prophetic text, though some books focus more on predictions than others. 596 of the 735 predictions have indeed occurred and have literally come true, according to the scripture prediction. So, 81% of all Bible prophecies have already come true, and some of those prophecies were made centuries before the case. It doesn't take a lot of self-assurance to accept the possibility that the remaining 19% will also take place. That's a very impressive total score. How many of these predictions remain to come true before Jesus returns? The answer is about 20, 
and we are watching to see those happen first before we look for the Lord's return. Heavenly Father, in the midst of the visions of Revelation, as the bowls are poured out upon the earth, we are reminded of your sovereign power and justice. May we draw near to you, seeking understanding and wisdom in these times. Guide us, O Lord, as the waters turn bitter and darkness falls. Amidst the trials that feel overwhelming, remind us of your eternal love and the promise of salvation. Let our hearts be steady and our faith unwavering. Help us to be bearers of hope, even as the earthquakes and uncertainty surround us. Strengthen our spirits to stand firm, rooted in your word, sharing the message of redemption with all. Forgive our transgressions and open our eyes to the truth. Let us not be swayed by the distractions of this world, but keep our gaze firmly on you. As the world around us changes, may we find comfort in the unchanging nature of your love. Grant us the grace to endure, the hope to believe, and the strength to witness your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.